Stan Jibalisco here with a continuation of our tutorial sequence of videos in regards to the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics. For the whole roster of these videos uh, that explain various aspects of the circuits described in this book, go to my YouTube channel and go to the playlist entitled Beginner's Schematics. This book was published in October of 2013 by McGraw-Hill, the TAB Books Division. TAB, T-A-B. That old uh, brand used to, way back in the 1960s, 1970s, it stood for Technical Advisory Board, and they operated out of Blue Ridge Summit, Pennsylvania, a town very much like, uh, uh, like the town I live in now except probably a little bit warmer and a little bit wetter. Anyway, this particular book, edited by me, the third edition, previous editions published by or written by Traster and Lisk. Improvements in this edition include completely redrawn art, uh, edited text, and the addition of some follow-the-flow uh, blurbs that explain how the signals and currents travel through the circuits diagrammed in this book. Um, previous editions, the reviewers, some of them, some of you, had asked for this, and so I decided I ought to meet your request if I can and do the best I can to make you happy. And uh, the purpose of these videos in this whole sequence is to help you follow some more flow and in some more detail. Some of the circuits are the same. Some of them are ones that I don't describe follow the flow in in the book. Note the spiral binding. Note the paper, heavy stock paper. Get the paper bound version. I've explained why in various other videos. What I'd like to look at now is the circuits on pages 94 and 95 uh, which show what we would call low-pass filter circuits using inductors and capacitors. These are low-pass LC filters. Low-pass LC filters. The simplest version of that kind of a circuit uses a series connected inductor and a capacitor in parallel like this. Chassis ground symbol here. Note, a, note the curved line in the capacitor. The curved line in the capacitor symbol indicates the plate or plates that should more nearly be connected to electrical ground. Here's our input. And then we take our output right here. Okay. Now I'm not going to finish this particular drawing yet because uh, there are other low pass filters. We can add more components to this circuit and make it actually work even better. Unfortunately what I've done in this particular drawing is to get ahead of myself and make it impossible for me to modify it, so I'm going to have to draw it all over again for you, but I will do that. This is called an L network because of the way the components are shaped. And it looks like an L, doesn't it? If you rotate it 90 degrees and then flip it over, you get an L. So it's called an L network. Take it, rotate it, look at it in a mirror, and you'll see the L. All right? Well, the input here, well, I might as well finish it and take the output here, like this. Now, how this works, in order to provide what they call a low-pass response, is the inductor tends to have more and more attenuation as the frequency goes up, and less and less attenuation as the frequency goes down, so it discriminates against higher frequencies. The capacitor 
on the other hand, tends to favor the higher frequencies. It has a higher impedance at the lower frequencies and a lower impedance at the higher frequencies. So by placing the inductor in series, we discriminate against high frequencies. By placing a capacitor in parallel, we also discriminate against high frequencies because as the frequency goes up, the impedance of that capacitor goes down and it more and shorts more and more of the signal to ground. So a low pass response, as you might call it, if you graph amplitude on the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis, increasing frequency going to the right, stronger and stronger signals going up, you'll get a response that looks something like this. Gradual roll off or decline like that. Well, oh, that's cool. That's an L network. Well, we can take that same circuit, that same L network, and add another capacitor here in front of the inductor. So we now have two capacitors and an inductor. And then we take our output from there. Well, now, what does that gain? Why, why would we want to add another capacitor to the L network and get a circuit like this? L, C1, C2. Let's just call that L1. This is still an LC network, but it is not shaped like an L anymore. It's shaped kind of like a Greek letter pi, so they call this little thingy a pi network. Pi network. It's a low pass filter. Okay. Well, if we graph amplitude versus frequency for this configuration versus that one, we're going to get a sharper cutoff. And that's the advantage of adding that extra component. Well, we can go on. We can add another inductor. Same value as L1. And another capacitor, same value as C1 and C2. In case I didn't mention it, these should have identical values. So these two inductors have identical values, these three capacitors have identical values, and we take our output from there. You may be asking yourself, why didn't he just draw a single line like that and then a single ground symbol? And the answer is, I could. It's a perfectly good way to do it. If you'd rather do it that way, be my guest. But what we have here is a more complicated circuit called a Pi L network because it's like an L network tacked onto a Pi network. And if we, and you might guess, well, that, what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that we will get an even tighter roll off. Now you could think, oh well, you can just keep cascading these over and over and over again. You can keep going on and on and on and on and on and make it sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper. Well, to a certain point that will work, but it only works up to a certain point of diminishing returns where you can, it really isn't going to gain you anymore if you keep on doing that. It's sort of like pounding a nail once it's all the way in. You can keep pounding on the nail, but it isn't going to go any more all the way in. All the way in is all the way in. It's kind of like that. Or like you're driving your big number eight down the freeway, and it, you're going as fast as you possibly can with the thing. You've got it floored. That's the end of the line there. You're not going to be able to move that thing any faster unless you <laughs> encounter a downslope or something point of diminishing returns. So that's how this works. These inductors choke off the higher frequencies by operating in series and attenuating 
higher frequencies and letting lower frequencies pass more easily. These components do just the opposite. They let the higher frequencies pass more easily, but they let them pass to ground instead of to the output, so the effect by connecting the capacitors in parallel is inherently the same in regards to this graph as the inductors in series. That'll do it for this little tutorial. Go to pages um, 94 and 95 of the book, Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics and also to drawing them and if you really want a lot of information about all how inductors, capacitors and all that good stuff works get my book Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics look for the latest edition and have fun this thing is as big as the Toyota Tundra instruction manual 700 plus pages and you know if it's that big it's got to be good, right? Stan Jabalisco signing off. Until next time, so long.